Face down on a broken street There's a man in the corner in a pool of misery I'm in a white van as a red sea covers the ground Metal crash, I can fix We invite you to pay close attention to this video concerning the safety procedures to be adopted in the NL Auditorium in Rome. The auditorium has two floors, the ground floor and the basement floor. The central area consists of the Avogadro Hall and the Galvani Hall, which can form a single large open space when required. An additional four halls are located on the basement floor. There are five emergency exits in the auditorium, one on the basement floor and four on the ground floor. They can be reached by means of escape routes indicated by appropriate signs and shown on the plans displayed inside the auditorium. In the event of an emergency, if an evacuation is necessary, the alarm is raised using sirens and the activation of visual and acoustic alarm panels. In the event of an emergency situation, this must be reported directly to the people in charge or by activating specific manual alarms. For further information, see the notice on safety rules to be found inside the hall. We also remind you that smoking is not permitted inside the NL Auditorium, nor within the entire building. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to our Rest for May Day Investor for Egypt. Um, my name is Roberto Vigotti. I'm the Secretary General of Rest for Med. Two years ago, we launched the, the association in this very room. And uh, I wanted to say that the things have changed quite a lot since then. We still are in dialogue. We still are in a proactive role with the uh, southern country. And two years ago, if you remember, the, uh, the association were in dialogue with other association, other initiative. The mainstream, however, was still that bankability for renewable was mainly due to the import to Europe. In three years, things have changed. Now, this initiative has done a great job in uh, analysis, in uh, promoting uh, and kickstart uh, a lot of a, a local, a national, and regional uh, program. It was very important, but at that time, three years ago, I call the green energy reservoir for you doesn't hold anymore, simply because we don't need much more energy. On the contrary, we are in an economic crisis, we are using efficiency, and we have already reached our targets. So when we started, if you remember, we proposed this kind of uh, 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 trademark, which still is in in my, in my brochure, you have it, to show that we want to see things upside down in a way. We want to see things seen mostly from the southern uh, country. I remember at that time the people there said, Robert, Mr. Vigotti, you have a, a slide upside down. Can we change it? I said, no, no, keep it. In fact, uh, this idea of working with the south with a different perspective is still valid. But we found out, thanks to Dr. Granara, that our bottom-up approach was already Describe it in 1154 uh, or 548 Egira, and you guess where? This is a map of the Mediterranean. I think it's very difficult for you to understand the Mediterranean seen in this perspective, north south. But if you take a little second to change it, you see that this is the Mediterranean, in fact. And this is a map. You can guess where it was was done. Sicily is much bigger than the rest of it, and in fact it was done by a famous geographer, Mohammed Al Idrisi. He was working at the, at the Kingdom of Norman King, Roger II of Sicily. And this book is called The Book Pleasant Journey into Faraway Lands, Nuzat Al Mushat, whatever it comes after. So to show you this at that time in Sicily, in 1544. A Norman king was working with the Muslim, Jewish, and Christian working on geography. This map, believe it or not, has been for three centuries the most accurate map in the world. 
why the conference today? Uh, the country in the south are undergoing a phase of political transition, and Egypt is uh, bravely taking the lead in providing its citizens enough supply of energy. And of course, uh, they don't need just renewable, they need energy. By the way, they also have renewable, but they need energy. Their priority is attracting investment for, uh, for them together. That's the main title of this conference. And uh, again, fostering public-private partnership. There is no way that the state alone or private sector alone can make it. And that will be very interesting to hear from our member, from the investor, from the industry people, how they want to uh, deploy this uh, uh, partnership. Of course, the long term remains, hopefully, a uh, fully integrated euro maintenance market. But at this moment, we need to, to, de to t tackle the challenge and priority for each country. And I remember what was said uh, in Sharm el Sheikh uh, a few weeks ago, by the way, it was our Prime Minister, Egypt and Italy are custodian of a unique space as they are at the opposite end of a bridge of a challenge and opportunity. I think today the title of the conference, in fact, is uh, Challenge Opportunity. It was not done on purpose, it was before that. And we have uh, this uh, agenda. I, I think you have the agenda in your folder. The agenda is an uh, uh, institutional part, of course. Uh, and the key players, and I'm really honored to have all these names here. And then, of course, we have uh, the session, la creme de la creme, the session with the Egyptian people, who will, uh, I'm very honored to have uh, uh, Professor uh, El Sobki, Sam El Sain, and Mohamed Shaib, who will give us the essence why come to Egypt and how we can guarantee you, you, you should come. And then, of course, we have a, a short presentation by Irina on the coalition, the new coalition on addressing the message for renewable, and I'm glad that Christian Kaya was kind enough to come here to present for the first time the proposal for Egyptian landscape. Then we have, uh, before lunch, um, a session with my shareholder, my, 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 my boss here, all of them, and we will try to see why they are really supporting this idea. Then after lunch, which will be also outside, we shall have two interesting sessions, one on financing, renewable energy tender, feeding tariff, uh, and bankability. And I'm glad that Paolo Frankel came from Paris from the IEA to, to stimulate uh, six uh, high outstanding uh, 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 panelists uh, from the financing. And we close, uh, last but not least, with Antonello Camiseca, the head of business uh, development of Energy Green Power, who will chair and moderate a session with uh, uh, five top level, again, uh, uh, industrial people. Uh, we hope to close by four, Six, five, maximum four o'clock. I just want to tell you that all this has been videotaped, um, taped, so we will probably put on our YouTube uh, later on all the presentation, and some of us already asked if we will have us a DVD, but certainly will be available, so you don't have to take too many notes, but will be all uh, recorded. So I need uh, your approval to distribute this after. So with this, I think I'm finished, and I have the pleasure to present you now Dr. Venturini, with Francesco Intuini, who is the CEO of Energy Green Power, but as far as I'm concerned, is the, my president. Francesco Ventuini will lead the, the introduction and the, the first session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto, for your introduction. Uh, welcome to Rome, welcome to res for med I hope that uh, you didn't get too dizzy uh, looking at those uh, rotating slides from, uh, from Roberto's presentation. Um, in quality of president of the association uh, res for med uh, I will uh, briefly talk today uh, about the association's view and recommendation for uh, renewable development uh, in the Mediterranean. And I will give you a brief uh, overview on rest for med mission and strategy. Today we don't talk about conventional energy, today we talk about uh, renewables. So let's have uh, a first uh, look at uh, the renewable energy growth uh, potential in the southern shore of the Mediterranean region. It's a region very rich in terms of availability of renewables uh, energy resources, uh, wind and solar power in particular. The abundance of resources is a crucial factor to make renewables uh, competitive with fossil fuel generation and to increase energy independence. Recent technology developments in uh, renewable energy combined with the region potential in wind and solar power uh, could create significant advantage for those countries that more decisively 
um, decide to capitalize on them. Renewable technologies present several features that makes them particularly attractive uh, for policymakers. Technology costs decreased dramatically in the latest year, thanks to the scale of deployment reached at global level. And renewables can be competitive with conventional energy. There is no doubt about that. They are quickly deployable, since the time required to, be, uh, to build uh, is way shorter than the time required for conventional power plants. This is crucial to respond uh, to the needs uh, of North Af African economies, which are rapidly growing and require reliable and affordable power supply. Renewable can contribute also to local job creation, and I think this is another important point, and increase energy security, another important point, ensuring a more balanced energy mix and reducing the exposure to the volatility of energy commodities price. Last but not least, uh, renewables are highly reliable and combined with some flexibility tools, they are now able to provide energy at all times. However, several challenges remain to be addressed, and we know all this. This is true not only for uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Actually, it's so important uh, that it's also important for Europe. Europe has still a long way to go. Here, as you can see, over three quarters of the barriers can be overcome through sound and clear government policies and measures. For instance, establishing consistent long-term strategies and plans for developing renewables. Introducing the necessary stable and clear legislation in order to ensure legal certainty. Ensuring stability of revenue streams using either PPAs or feed-in tariff schemes to foster private investments. For what concerns the remaining quarter, it's expected to decrease over time as renewable technology cost is constantly decreasing thanks to the technology improvements and the learning curve effect. Several barriers are already being tackled and addressed by most of the countries in the area. Indeed, the southern and eastern shore countries of the Mediterranean are undergoing a phase of transition. In particular, the rising electricity demand requires immediate solutions. Their goal is those to cover their increasing energy demand, improve energy security of supply, while promoting jobs and industrial development. Matching this demand with conventional electricity generation would put further pressure on state budgets for fossil fuel importing countries, while fossil fuel producing countries would lose potential revenues from oil and gas exports. Governments understood all this and are blending renewable energy in the normal energy mix to increase energy security and to provide sustainable energy. RESFORMED. RESFORMED aims at overthrowing all barriers that are preventing or limiting the renewables growth in the Mediterranean region. To give you all a bit of background, RESFORMED is a non-profit organization founded in 2012 whose mission is to support the deployment of renewable energy, both utility scale and distributed generation. It's made of several members operating in different sectors and realities, including energy generation and transmission sector, manufacturers, consultancy and engineering services, sectoral associations and academia. Everyone, through its own know-how and expertise, gives its contribution to make Res4Med an innovative association. Resformed is able to leverage on its diversity and benefit from the knowledge of different actors involved in order to outline and convey the lessons learned and key messages to its Mediterranean stakeholders. How Resformed aims to accomplish such a mission? Resformed adopted a bottom-up approach in order to better understand local needs and to be able to propose customized solutions to the local context in collaboration with the institutional and local partners. The association performs markets analysis and studies on specific and relevant energy issues. In addition, ResFormed organizes periodically capacity building seminars and training courses to disseminate best practices and procedures on res regulation. Despite the great results achieved so far and motivated by the will of being more efficient and effective, 
Recently, the association decided to review its internal structure and governance to streamline the decision-making process and consequently to act faster. We need to act faster. Moreover, the association has set also new targets for the current year and the years to come. Among them, one of the key objectives is to further involve within the association technology partners to improve our expertise on all renewable technologies and along the old value chain. Southern energy institutions, companies and entities to strengthen the dialogue and enhance the comprehension of local needs. Today, once again, res med provided a substantial contribution in organizing this event dedicated to Egypt, and I'm sure that this day will be the start for a fruitful cooperation between our organization and the Egyptian country. Thank you all. I now leave the floor to Mr. Khaled El Tawel, first secretary of the Embassy of Egypt here in Rome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ventoloni. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, good morning. Sabah al khair. Uh, it gives me great honor and the pleasure to be here today uh, to discuss a very important topic for the future of Egypt, Egyptian economic development, which is uh, renewable energy. Uh, talking about investment, I will touch on three main issues. The first one is political, the political atmosphere in Egypt. Second is the economic uh, indicators and the third, the specificities of the renewable energy. On, on the political situation, um, and after two great revolutions, the government of Egypt has adopted a roadmap, a political roadmap for transition. The first two milestones, which were uh, the constitution and the presidential elections, are ended, are completed. Now we are waiting for the parliamentary election, which should be ended by the end of this year, and which should end the roadmap. For the economic environment, the government is working to put Egypt's economy back on track through a macroeconomic policy framework. And the structural reform program rests on three fundamental principles. One, prudent macroeconomic policies, which will progress alongside long-term economically viable development projects with high level intensity. Two, partnership between the government and the private sector. And three, a balance between physical consolidation and social justice. The government has made uh, clear strides toward regaining confidence in the economy through serious and comprehensive reforms to restore economic, uh, economic growth to pre-2011 rates, which were 7%. Among the boldest moves so far is the slashing uh, of wasteful energy subsidies. This was a very important step and very difficult step. Uh, it the, the decrease in the energy subsidies is 30%, which amounts to 6 billion US dollars. Additionally, the government has taken uh, measures to improve the taxing system and widen the tax base, also to reform the foreign exchange market dynamics. To encourage and incentivize economic growth, the government has launched a number of national mega projects, including the new South Canal, the Golden Triangle, uh, industrial mining, uh, a commercial and tourism center between Kenya and the Red Sea, a housing and commercial development uh, at the north, uh, northwest coast. Among these projects is an investment of nearly one billion in new solar energy projects with the aim of increasing the sharing of renewable energy in the Egyptian energy mix to 20%. Uh, in the Sharm Sheikh conference last, last month, the government has adopted new investment law, which is more supportive to foreign investment. There were many legislative changes that have been formulated, mainly amending the law aimed at respecting contract between the government and investors, and removing legal hurdles that previously caused lengthy and costly contract dispute and litigation. The economic indicators in Egypt are improving. The IMF expects that the economic growth rate to be 4% in 2015. Foreign reserves are on the rise. The stock exchange is gaining momentum. In the last months, during the uh, Economic Development Conference, major large-scale investment 
have been announced, including with British Petroleum, with ENI, with General Electric, with Siemens, with uh, Amal and others. Major rating agencies, including Moody's and Standard Poor's and Fitch, have improved the rating of the Egyptian economy. Third segment today is the renewable energy in Egypt. Energy is a, a critical element in Egypt economic development. Achieving high sustainable economic growth and improving standard of living across the country will lead to corresponding increase in energy demand. Egypt increased, uh, Egypt's generation capacity currently shows a negative reserve margin relative to peak demand. The country needs to increase capacity, capacity every year on average by 5.2 gigawatt through 2022 which translate into investment requirement of 5 billion US dollar billion. That's why we need foreign direct investment in this field. The government is committed to improve the supply of the renewable energy sector in Egypt, keeping in mind that the power generation mix is highly concentrated on oil and gas, around 91%. There are reasons for optimism. Egypt has the highest wind energy potential in the Middle East and North Africa, 30 gigawatt or close to the entire current generation capacity and enjoys very high direct solar radi radiation across its large land mass. Regional integration also offers possibilities. The government's short to medium term strategy includes measures to re revive the sector and the bridge the gap between supply and demand over five years. The government has begun the process of liberalizing generation, transmission and distribution activities in the, in the power sector and eventually restricting the role of the state to that of a regulator and supervisor. On September last year, the government took a major step in this regard by approving the issuance of feed-in tariffs for electricity projects produced from renewable energy resources. A total target is to authorize 4,300 megawatt to be achieved over the first period of applying the feed-in tariffs. The, ele the electricity transmission company um, is committed to purchase the produced electricity from power plants at the price announced by the Cabinet of Ministers for long-term contracts between 20 and 25 years. Considering its vitality for stimulating economic growth and sustainable development, and, uh, renewable energy was very uh, much on the top of the uh, conference in Sharm el-Sheikh last month. Egypt signed, during this conference, Egypt signed deals uh, and MOUs with international partners to build new power plants with a total capacity of nearly 45 gigawatt, out of which about 8.7 gigawatt from solar, 2.5 from wind, and 2.1 from hydropower. Before I conclude, I would like to stress that there are great chances for strengthening cooperation between Egypt and Italy in all fields. We believe that our two countries have great potential co for cooperation in the energy field, including natural gas as well as renewable energy. Given its position at a crossroad of number of energy corridors linking Africa and South Africa and, and Southern Mediterranean, and the abundance of resources of renewable energy, Egypt can act, can, can act as a future energy hub in the region. Last month, Prime Minister Renzi was in Sharm el-Sheikh to attend the economic conference. His participation emphasized the commitment for strengthening bilateral cooperation in all fields. I quote from his speech, Egypt must be a bridge between this part of the world and Europe. I think this precisely reflects the essence of cooperation between our two countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Khaled, for uh, this introduction. Of course, in the main session, we will go in details there. And now I'm uh, honored to introduce uh, the institutional uh, welcome. The first one is uh, Gilberto Dialuce, uh, Director General of the Security of Supply and Infrastructure, our Minister of uh, Economic development. Gilberto, thank you for coming here. Now you are very famous. You go on the first page of the newspaper with the photos of your. Thank you so much. <laughs> Many thanks for, the, for organizing this conference and for the invitation to the Ministry that gives us the possibility, the opportunity to share with you our views on the cooperation on renewables and in particular 
uh, with the southern Mediterranean uh, area. Uh, let me start saying that the force uh, to, to promote ambitious and effective energy cooperation among the European Union, the southern and eastern Mediterranean countries have been deployed uh, for several years in different formats, uh, the, the Euromed Barcelona process, uh, the neighborhood policy, the Union for Mediterranean. And uh, some important results have been achieved so far in terms of uh, policy dialogue, uh, financial support, uh, technical assistance, uh, investment project, uh, but also, unfortunately, some failures uh, are listed in this implementation uh, of these formats. Uh, so uh, we think that we need to continue to constructing uh, uh, new actions to, to boost this cooperation. Uh, the energy challenges uh, in the European Union, the Mediterranean partners, are facing uh, uh, today uh, uh, call for a reorientation of their cooperation energy issues. Uh, the shared objective uh, of ensuring energy security, uh, environmental sustainability and economic development uh, remains a priority for all the Euro-Mediterranean countries. Uh, recent events have, under have underlined how the issues of energy security of many countries, uh, and not only the Euromed ones, uh, is increasingly interconnected. And economic development remains a priority for all the Euro Mediterranean countries. For the above, during the presidency of the European Council uh, last year, Italy has taken over the situation uh, by simulating uh, new working hypotheses uh, among the countries involved. Uh, and this hypothesis has been approved by the high level conference uh, uh, co organized by our ministry and the, Euro and the European Commission last November in Rome, and also Egypt uh, attended to this uh, important uh, conference. And the new actions uh, wish to, to reinforce uh, the existing cooperation activities and structure in three broad policy areas. In particular, the partnership framework uh, will consist of three uh, thematic platforms to be set up and dedicated to the sector of gas, electricity, and renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, this platform should support the systematic dialogue of all concerned public and private stakeholders, providing a permanent forum for discussing energy policy objectives and measures in order to identify concrete steps and actions uh, to be implemented. Uh, the Euro Mediterranean Platform of Gas already started its work, uh, and the uh, first meeting uh, was held last March in Brussels, and the official kickoff meeting uh, will, uh, will take uh, uh, soon place in Tunis in June. And for the Euro Mediterranean Platform for the electricity market and for renewables energy efficiency, <coughs> Uh, we believe the, the cooperation among the regional association uh, and the regulatory authorities, MEDREG, METSO, the Union for Mediterranean, and also REST for MED, could support the development for this platform. Uh, we think that uh, the, uh, this platform could be launched soon in order to have then defined and approved uh, for the next ministerial meeting in November. Uh, this platform should assist in our views, governments and industry operation in the uh, deployment of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies uh, and also project uh, and uh, plans for energy efficiency. And also to create uh, uh, some favorable conditions for private sector investments. In the same context, uh, the high level conference in Rome was also underlined to need uh, to the need to uh, to act concretely, uh, identify some specific project that could be operational in the short term. Uh, in particular, uh, I want to mention the, the first interconnection project with Italy and the, uh, the grid of Tunisia that was discussed many times and now. Uh, has been uh, re-evaluated uh, in order to have a new connection, not no more with the having to uh, import to Italy renewables produced in the South Shore, but with the possibility to export uh, energy uh, from the North to the South and also to increase the security of supply and the, uh, and the energy security of both the shores of the Mediterranean areas. 
coming to the, this conference, uh, we appreciate the Egyptian interest in development uh, of energy from renewable sources, uh, because this means uh, diversification of the energy resources uh, to, and to maximize the benefits uh, using the local ones, and invest in electricity generation from renewable sources that are rich in Egypt. Uh, this was confirmed by the recent adoption, uh, as the embassy said, of a government agree of the feed-in tariffs, uh, which introduced special rates for private investors uh, who wish to establish power plants of this type in Egypt and the program uh, to develop uh, two gigawatt from solar and other two gigawatt from wind uh, power. In this context, uh, we certainly can, uh, can give a significant contribution to the Egyptian projects, uh, having in Italy very consolidated technologies, uh, culture and management system of renewables uh, with a significant experience uh, in our country that we can uh, export. Uh, in conclusion, let me say that uh, we are not to forget that uh, uh, traditionally energy security has been defined as uh, an interrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price by the International Energy for, en for Energy. But uh, due to the larger dimension of today's globalized energy markets, we are progressively shifting towards uh, a concept of energy security as a global good. Uh, whose general availability is also dependent, uh, among other factors, uh, on the policies designed and implemented at the international level. Uh, it means uh, that the real energy security strategy is needed to address short, medium and long term challenges and countries have to cooperate uh, even more in order to define a common shared policy to address the energy uh, security. Uh, it is uh, beyond question that the promotion of renewable energy uh, is an ongoing process uh, and that the direction uh, to this goal has been already set uh, for the, all the roadmaps for decarbonization in the European Union, but also in the Mediterranean area. But the true challenge is now is to uh, ensure that the continuing push for renewables uh, coexist in a market-based uh, environment uh, and also within the framework of energy security. And this conference, uh, I guess, that will be the right place uh, where to discuss it. Thanks. Thank you, Director Di Luce, not only for your welcome, but also for the consideration, the content of your introduction. And now um, I pass the, the floor to Enrico Renara, uh, the coordinator of the multilateral affairs in the MENA region from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who will address us and uh, talking about how EC is renewable in, the, in this moment. Thank you, Enrico. Good morning to you all. <clears throat> also on behalf of uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, the Honorable Paolo Gentiloni, I congratulate res for med for this initiative, which from my specific position as a promoter of Italian activities within the Union of uh, the Mediterranean, I see to be very uh, consistent with the uh, UFM uh, framework of activities, in, uh, which is uh, included in one of the three platforms that are now being shaped uh, of our new Euro-Mediterranean uh, Euro cooperation in the energy sector. My previous speakers made a more extensive reference to that. I will limit myself to uh, make a shorter reference to the Euromed platform on renewable energies and energy efficiency. In fact, the conclusions of the Euromed conference of Rome on November 2004 stated that this platform should assist governments and industry operators in the deployment of renewable energy and energy efficiency technologies and projects and of national energy efficiency action plans and the creation of favorable conditions for private sector investments. It is proposed that this platform be supported by the UFM Secretariat, building on its experience inter alia in relations to the MED Solar Plan. The subject of the MED Solar Plan was raised by the Ministers of Foreign Affairs of our 
42 Euromed countries in Barcelona a week ago when it was uh, uh, confirmed that the obstacles preventing two of our major partners in Europe to go ahead in their interconnection uh, services were finally removed, uh, confirming a previous statement uh, in this sense made during the European Council in March. This is definitely a good news, which comes at a time uh, when we are all concerned uh, with the issues of energy security in, in the presence of the new important trends in the energy field, namely the gas market, the energy transition issues, um, the electric infrastructures, which are a specific uh, UFM uh, focus. Um, all these issues are related to the evolving balance, as we know, between demand and supply across the overall regional network. These are very complex issues that I would um, leave to eagerly to energy experts. However, one of the factors in this complex picture is the role of the long-time suppliers uh, in the region and, and how much they will contribute in the future in terms of regional stabilization. Let, let's just think about the, the Libyan case today. It is in this context that res for med is one of the regional organizations committed to work with a new dynamic approach to make this new renewable and energy efficiency platform lively and effective. And we are all called to be supportive uh, with, this, with these efforts. 2015, I believe, will be uh, an important year to make progress in, the, in this uh, domain. And Italy is confident that despite the complexity and, and the presence of factors which are difficult to rule, it, a substantial step forward is possible. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rico Granada, for your kind words. Let me acknowledge also the presence of Ambassador Maras, who oversees the global energy uh, for Italy and is my boss in the AI as well. Thank you for coming. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Bruno Lesquer, who is representing uh, not only the uh, Mediterranean Observatory of Energy uh, president, but also the distinguished leader in uh, international energy, uh, being the CEO of Edison. Bruno, it's again a pleasure. You were here two years ago, so you can make your comment on the future. Thank you, grazie. Thank you. It's okay. Good morning. <coughs> I'm very honored to be uh, here and to address our distinguished audience for the, this workshop here in Rome, not only as a CEO of Edison, but also as uh, chairman of OMI, Observatoire Méditerranéen de l'Energie. Both Edison and uh, OMI has indeed been a, a long friend of Egypt, uh, working more than 20 years uh, with this country in an excellent uh, cooperation spirit. Let me take this opportunity also to thank our new uh, president for <coughs> Res for Med, Mr. Venturini, and uh, I want to thank him for the invitation to participate to this discussion today. Let me also uh, salute the uh, previous speaker or the speaker of, the, of this se session. <coughs> Mr. Dialucci, Mr. Granara, Mr. Frankel, Mr. Emtara, and Mr. Tawil. <coughs> and uh, I will also uh, give a warm welcome to uh, our Egyptian OME members and friends of EGPC, EHC, EGAS, and also our partners ETC, NRIA, and NRC, and par particularly Mr. Mohamed El Sobki. <coughs> Chairman of NRIA and an old friend of OEMI, Mr. Ahmed El Anafi Mohamed, Chairman of uh, Egyptian Electricity Transmission Company, and Mr. Mohamed Shoib, Managing Director and Head of Energy uh, Division, Kala Holdings. Uh, dear friend, <coughs> the Mediterranean region accounts for 10% of the world energy demand. In the north, 
The slow demographic growth and the economic crisis, coupled with energy efficiency measures, has led to an overall decrease in energy demand over the last five years of 8%. In the South, on the contrary, energy demand is boosted by sustained demographic and economic growth with an increase in energy demand of more than 12% over the past five years. Currently, the total energy <coughs> demand in Mediterranean region stands at around 1,000 million tonnes of equivalent oil. <coughs> but OME business as usual scenarios show that the demand will increase by over 60% to 2040, reaching ne nearly <coughs> 1,600 million tonnes of oil equivalent. All of the increase will come from the south, where energy demand will triple. This situation will exacerbate energy security issues, both for the traditionally energy dependent countries and for energy exporting countries. It will also have an impact on the environment. In this context, natural gas, but also energy efficiency and renewable are with no doubt part of the solution for sustainable energy development. Currently, renewables account for over 31% of total installed electricity capacity in the whole region, 35% in the north and 22% in the south. The region has, with no doubt, a very relevant renewable energy potential. However, renewable energy development should be adapted to the need and context of each country and only if economically efficient. Renewable energy development should not be pursued at any price, as unfortunately some EU countries have already done. But today, my main message would be <coughs> that we have a unique opportunity to remove uh, <coughs> unnecessary subsidies thanks to the recent oil price drop. Many countries on the South Mediterranean shore, Egypt included, have been facing a difficult challenge in the past years. Satisfying the electricity demand growth, which is sustained by develop, developing economy and demographic expansion, but at the same time, providing electricity at affordable prices for both industries and individuals. Instead of being sources of foreign trade income, domestic hydrocarbon have been largely dedicated to power generation at a value well below the international market prices in order to ensure affordable final electricity prices. This subsidization mechanism has in turn reduced the incentive to install new highly efficient generation units in place of the existing old, less efficient and less environmentally friendly ones. In this framework, use of the domestically produced hydrocarbon has soared, fueling the, last <coughs> the fast development of the countries and stimulating, in turn, a continuous increase of the demand. As a result, countries used to be strong exporters of oil and gas, such as Egypt, are now facing a new reality of becoming net importers. According to OME scenarios, if current trends are carried out, overall Egyptian energy demand will triple to 2040. The electricity demand will more than triple as well, leading to a need in additional generation capacity of approximately 100 gigawatts by 2040, the diversification efforts to increase nuclear and coal generation encouraged by the Egyptian energy policy will not prevent the country from becoming a gas importer beyond 2030, if nothing is done to curb energy intensities. Moreover, subsidies by artificially lowering the price of the convention <coughs> conventionally generated electricity have also hindered the diffusion of renewable energy sources generation in a region with a great potential. As a result, the North Mediterranean 
and European countries, renewables provide a larger share of the energy mix than in the South Mediterranean countries. The current drop in oil prices offers a unique opportunity to address this distortion by progressively but ab aggressively phasing out the incentive on all mature technologies, both for conventional, conventional and renewable, with current oil price. The transition to a cost-reflecting electricity market will in fact minimize the consequences in terms of price increase. This would attract investment in renewable, but also in new conventional plants needed to meet the expected medium and long-term growth in demand. At the same time, the internal power generation-related hydrocarbon consumption could be reduced, releasing natural resources for other domestic uses or for import reduction or export purpose. The creation of a non-subsidized electricity market would release, in perspective, state budget resources for other purposes, possibly including also direct support to end users and users that need to be helped. Moreover, it would ensure that investments are concentrated on those opportunities that are intrinsically more economically sustainable. This progressive but reliable phase-out of the current subsidization schemes, which are hardly sustainable in the long run, would finally provide a trustworthy environment to attract private investment that are essential for the future of southern Mediterranean countries. These investments would also contribute to the economic development through the opportunities offered to local companies to participate in the manufacturing, construction, and operation and maintenance phases. This is the most important way to increase technological and best practice exchange between northern and southern Mediterranean countries. In, the, in this respect, Edison is already considering the participation in the Egyptian electricity market through the development of a gas to power project. In line with the principles mentioned above, it will allow use the <coughs> of the natural gas at much higher efficiency than that offered by the current average fuel fleet. Edison would thus be more than happy to put its experience in the conversion of existing steam units into modern CCGTs at the service of the countries. But Edison believes in the future of renewables as well. And actually, we have recently partnered with an Italian investor for the uh, development of renewable in our own country. We have created a strong platform for consolidating the Italian fragmented market in which each partner is contributing with its distinctive skills, energy management, operation and maintenance, regulation expertise, and efficient financing. As far as Egypt is concerned, we also consider that renewable development is a sizable opportunity for all kinds of investors, but also, and especially, for Egyptian investors. Mature renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar, are indeed based on <coughs> standard technologies and their modularity allows investment of both small and large scale. A distributed generation model could also offer additional benefits in a region where distances, sometimes between generation centers and isolated customers, often implies important transmission and distribution burdens. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane Lasker, for your framing of the Egyptian case in the broader Mediterranean context uh, with me. And now the floor, zooming back to AIEA, I have my great pleasure to introduce Paolo Frankel, the director of the, the head of the, of the division renewable of the AIEA, who will frame the MENA region in the broader context. Thank you. Good morning. It's um, indeed, thank you very much to Energreen Power and Rest for Med. Thank you, Francesco and Roberto, for inviting me at this important event. It's an honor to represent the IEA uh, today and a pleasure to do it at NL and in my hometown, Rome. Now, I wish to start from the big picture. And why that? For two reasons. Because it is progress that has been in the past in the rest of the world. 
which uh, um, allows to open new market today. And the second is also to learn from this experience and not necessarily repeat the same mistakes where mistakes have been done and profit from the successes where they have been clear. Now, this acceleration of renewables in the Middle East and North African region, in particular Egypt, happens in a context of strong momentum for renewable electricity worldwide. In our forecast, we see electricity from renewables to grow almost by 50% in the next uh, five years up to 7,000 terawatt-hours globally by 2020, which corresponds to 26% of the share of the world, total generation. This is an increase of 0.8% per year happening every year. And uh, this is the second message of these slides, is that one third of this generation in 2020 will be from non-hydro electricity sources, mainly wind, but then also solar, and by energy. Now, and this is uh, big numbers, and just as a benchmark, I want to recall that electricity already in 2013 equaled, in terms of generation, the world production from gas, and were twice as much as uh, nuclear worldwide. Now, this allows to open new markets, because if you look at the same graph from another perspective, which is in which region this uh, growth has been happening and it's going to happen, it's somewhere else. It is not in Africa and the Middle East. They are barely visible on this chart. They are just beginning, which does not mean these are not important. It's they are profiting of the momentum worldwide. And although small in the global context so far, the renewable power in Menas is uh, fast growing. We see a growth of 75% at 8% cumulative average growth per year. And we will actually revise these numbers up in our forthcoming report, which is to be published later in uh, uh, October. Now, as an example, MENA countries are expected to emerge as one of the fastest growing of the PV market in the world. The color here represents not the absolute size of the market, but the velocity, the rate of growth. And as you can see, precisely the Middle East and precisely North Africa and Africa as a whole, actually, are together with Latin America the markets where the uh, um, uh, PV market will expand most in the next five years. What are the drivers that are underpinning this and what make this happen? The first is global technology and as a general remark, the fact that the renewable system prices, the investment costs are falling as you know, very dramatically in the case of PV, but also uh, more silently in the case of wind in terms of cost per kilowatt hour uh, because of technology process. There are cost differences still between OECD, China and other non-OECD, and it's important to be aware of these differences to understand what is the realistic cost of renewables, including wind and solar, in new market. Because, of course, there are transaction costs, of course, there are some costs that cannot be compressed, but overall, we can profit from technology learning, which is global and which is, as you know, driven mainly by also the Chinese um, counterpart. And one slide that I would like to spend one minute on that is uh, what is re really a big success in towards more competitive of renewables, it was mentioned before, the necessity to have a competitive deployment of renewables. These are recent long-term remuneration contract prices, either through long-term auctions and PPAs, or in some cases by very low feed-in tariffs for solar PV and wind. And without going into details, what the message which is very clear, these are generation costs that are well below $100 per megawatt hour, I would say in a sustainable way between 70 and 90. And then there are the two famous extreme, the, the famous case of the Dubai auction uh, below $60 per megawatt hour of PV in uh, recently that was signed by Aquapower, while for wind, the lowest uh, generation are still in the Americas. And I'm, sti I'm saying still, because there are re other regions in the world that have incredible good resources. Now, what has worked here? It's a combination of three things. Technology cost reduction and a, a very good supply chain uh, globally, 
better resources, so the renewables are being installed where the resource is the best, contrary to the past, which was more a policy-driven process, in particular in Europe, and there are appropriate regulatory framework attracting good financing conditions, and it has mentioned also by uh, Mr. Starace earlier today, the long-term uh, PPAs and price competition have been very effective drivers. At those prices, I want to state it very clearly, renewable can be competitive with new fossil fuel prices even in a regime of low oil prices globally, both competing with gas and oil. Now, the second driver, which has been mentioned also, is of course energy security. And if we look at the MENA region, we have very different countries in terms of net energy importer, net energy exporter. What you see here in this bubble diagram uh, looks at the dependency from either oil or gas, at the self-sufficiency on the x-axis, and the bubble size is the size of the market. And there is no, is no uh, case that the front runners in renewables are the countries which are either importing or, like in the Egyptian case, in the phase of the transition of becoming from a net exporter to a net importer. So the challenge is very, very, uh, um, uh, very pressing. And you can see that in these graphs, which are even more precise, Egypt has been supplying a big energy demand in the past years, mainly by gas. This has been a very, very uh, good thing. It should continue as much as possible. But if you look at the graph on the right, you see how domestic production is slightly decreasing, while consumption is increasing massively. And then the, uh, the obvious uh, uh, consequence of that is that Egypt is becoming a net importer, which has a strong push to uh, diversify in terms of electricity sources. Now, as, as you all know, the country has, been, uh, has had ambitious targets uh, for a long time, since 2008, but we, from a neutral um, external observation we, um, point of view, we observed limited implementation until last year for a number of reasons, political turmoils, concerns about the real implementation of support uh, policies and administrative barriers. In 2014, there was a radical change and a strong acceleration. The subsidy reform started, which has mentioned already before, it's an in crucial, important element of the policy. New auctions, new merchant contracts, feed-in tariffs for wind and PV were introduced. So the graph which is shown here, which is our previous forecast for Egypt for last year, which is very cautious with respect to the ambitious targets, we will certainly revise upside. And the how, so the question is not if we will do it, the question is how much we will revise. And I tell you, it's also important um, on uh, depending on how convincing some responses are coming from the conference today in our forecast um, uh, in the future. So let me conclude with three remarks. The first is the response for elect electricity and energy security relies always in portfolio solutions in a well-balanced energy mix and renewables are a crucial element of this portfolio for diversification and for energy security. We see the IA has al always uh, been looking at the, uh, at the Middle East as a major energy uh, field for fossil fuels. We now look at the region as a potential massive acceleration of renewables in the region and Egypt in particular. And the main driver, as I said, is security of supply and outstanding renewable resources. Some of them are a dream for the uh, OECD countries. But one part is important that maximizing cost efficiency remains crucial because of the scale and the rapidity of this transition. It has to be remain sustainable for the government and for society. This implies that cost of financing will be a key variable in this, even more than cost of technology itself. And one point which will certainly be debated uh, to the day is focus on consistency of policies and strategies, including on grids and infrastructures, which are a key variable to do this renewable electricity acceleration that we hope for. I thank you very much for your attention.